Hello and welcome to episode 203 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrodin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many, many other postings. How are you this afternoon, Bill? I'm still doing great, Seth. And you? You doing okay? I'm doing just dandy. Just I funny. never get to ask you that question. You always <laughs> ask me. <laughs> I'm fine. Fine as wine, as they say. Um, so this is our show's third episode of its second season. Uh, our first episode of season two aired a couple of weeks ago when Bill and I had retired Admiral Thomas Fargo on the show to give an introductory talk on U.S. Pacific submarines. Fleet boats, pig boats, silent service, whatever you want to call them. Uh, a service that is obviously very near and dear to Bill's heart. Now, this season will not be all about subs, uh, but there will be several, several episodes about submarines. Uh, but we felt it was right to pick up kind of where we left off, especially with last week's talk with Bill doing his uh, our, our Submarine 101 episode. And we this week, we're going to talk about a legendary boat with its legendary crew led by its legendary skipper. It's a submarine that is named after a fish, like all U.S. World War II fleet boats were. Uh, the submarine and the fish it's named after are one of the most appropriately matched pairs. The fish is a tropical fish that is considered to be a valuable and prized catch by sportsmen. Its elongated body is iridescent blue with silvery blue bars along its slender side. The fish has razor sharp teeth. Its growth is rapid, and it is among the fastest and most voracious eaters in the ocean. It tends to be a loner, solitary. When hooked, it is known to be a fighter, a highly prized catch if you can get one. The fish puts up a vicious fight and is known for its speed and strength on its run on the first hook. All of these adjectives describe both the boat and its aquatic namesake. The fish and the legendary U.S. fleet boat are both called Wahoo. So, Bill, with that... Let's yeah, talk about sure we it. Want to, as we go through our summary episodes, I'm not sure we want to, in every case, give an expose on the fish, like the USS Carp. We'll skip that one, okay? But, <laughs> <laughs> but this one in particular is fitting, isn't it? It is. It really is. If, if you know anything about World War II submarines in the Pacific, this is probably the one that comes, this one in Tang, for reasons that we will see, uh, come to the top of mind. And Wahoo was, and this is not arguable, was the first star of the show uh, when it comes to the silent service. So it's more than appropriate that it's our first fleet boat that we'll cover. And just to be clear to the listeners as we go through, um, we're not going to give a history of every <laughs> every submarine of the war. We're going to we're going to pick certain ones that are led by certain legendary skippers, O'Kane, Tarante, Slade Cutter, people like that. Or certain boats like Silversides, you know, things that did and, and it won't all be this season. We'll stretch out in the next couple of seasons, too. But it's appropriate that we start with Mush Morton and USS Wahoo because of the precedent that this boat and the cat who took over as the as her second skipper set for everybody that followed. Now. And we'll get into Mush's personality and we'll get into what he did and the specific things that he did and, you know, revolutionized or pioneered, whatever you want to say, as we go along. But this boat was a magnet for sailors who wanted to sail aboard her uh, after this one particular individual took command. And we're going to get into that. And I think by the end of this conversation, you're going to understand why. Um, so, Bill, Wahoo. Let's talk about a little bit about the boat. And this, she's a Gato class boat. And, you know, the three big classes of submarines in the Pacific and World War II, of course, Gato, Baleo, and I think the other one was with Tambor, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, yeah. The, the the final. Oh, towards the end. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of them are Gato class boats. And Wahoo is the most famous. And so the statistics we give on this boat, it covers all the Gato class boats. She was built in July 1941, so she was built before World War II um, at Mare Island Navy Shipyard in, in Vallejo, California. Uh, and, and this is – the Gato-class boats were a huge leap forward when it came to previous classes of boats, weren't they, Bill? I mean, we're talking about S-boats and R-boats and all this other stuff. 
Right. And, um, you know, there was a lot of advances made with this. It didn't have a snorkel. Germans didn't invent the snorkel until 43. I think they first started deploying them in 44. And we didn't have any snorkels on our submarines until after World War II. But beyond that, the standard that the Gato class basically st stayed the standard for submarines. They were improved on in, you know, not revolutionary, but evolutionary ways with Baleo and other follow-on classes until USS Nautilus, really, that was revolutionary, not right, revolutionary right. Yeah. in 55. But the standard that was set by the Gato carried the submarine force through the war. And as we said in the episode with Admiral Fargo, it was really up to the submarines and carriers after Pearl Harbor, when the surface fleet was really decimated, mm -hmm. to carry the war to the enemy until the surface fleet could be reconstituted. And the Gato class boats were the crux of that because they had long range, they had high speed. They were actually bigger submarines than the Gato class mm -hmm. um, before the Gato class was introduced to the fleet. But those bigger submarines were slower. And ironically, many of them had shorter ranges and weren't as effective, carried fewer mm -hmm. torpedo tubes, fewer torpedoes, and for those reasons, weren't as effective a warfighting submarine as the Gato class. Mm -hmm. And as you'll see, as the listeners and viewers will see, the Gatos are to to Bill's exact point is that these are the the these are the ships that these are the boats that carry the war from 1942. All the way to the end of the war. I mean, you just gave class boats like the Drum, which is in nearby Mobile, Alabama, to me and you, Bill, for that matter. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was launched in '42. It went all the way through. So, I mean, you know, th these are boats that see a lot of action. These are very <laughs> the taxpayers got their money's worth out of the Gato class right. boats. Mm -hmm. You know, so like all Gato class boats, Wahoo was powered by four diesel electric motors. She could attain a speed of 21 knots on the surface and nine knots submerged, but that's wide open, isn't it, Bill? That's sprinting. Yeah, you aren't going to stay that speed for long because you'll burn your battery out in one or two hours. The other thing about this particular boat was it had an experimental battery on oh, no, the, the Baleo. I don't know, maybe I'm thinking of the uh, Tang here. Baleo, uh, the Wahoo had the standard battery that didn't give us many fits mm -hmm. during the war. Another class, the Gato, another reason the Gato class was so such a go-to boat during the war. But it wasn't huge. It was only... 15, 25 tons surfaced, um, 24, 34 tons submerged. Of course, it displaces more water when it's submerged. So the displacement is different when it's submerged. If you want to get some sense of what that means compared to a Los Angeles class of 6,900 tons submerged or a Virginia class 7,000 tons submerged, it's about a quarter of the size of one of our modern submarines in terms of displacement. However, it's kind of 311 feet Los Angeles is 360 feet, so it's not much longer. And so that kind of gives you a sense. It had a smaller crew of 60 to 80 uh, sailors, depending on, you know, the, the, the manning varied with the war uh, compared to 115 or so with a modern submarine. Um, but the range was fantastic for a diesel boat with that 11,000 nautical mile range on the surface at 10 knots that's running at a very efficient speed for the diesels mm -hmm. and that that could really let these boats that that range in this design could really let these boats really reach out into the waters of the empire which is where they really prove their worth as we're about to see now wahoo was initially commissioned or she initially commissioned she was commissioned on may 15th 1942 and she was initially placed under the command of a gentleman named marvin kennedy he had a nickname uh, that is not so flattering <laughs> it was pinky uh, <laughs> but how he got that name god knows you know but it is what it is. We've talked about Naval Academy nicknames before, and uh, yeah. and not all of them are flattering. Um, but Kennedy mm -hmm. was a Naval Academy class in 1930. He was an old school submarine skipper, and we're going to talk about this in a second, what we mean by old school. He was a believer in the quote, the book. You know, he was he was more careful than he was aggressive. And we'll talk more about that here soon as well. Um, now, Kennedy and Wahoo, or Kennedy specifically, he had a fantastic crew underneath him. The people that specifically, I mean, God God bless the, the Blue Jackets, but specifically the officers that he had 
with him on these first two and a half patrols, uh, well, no, first two patrols on Wahoo, his mm. crew of officers was, they were amazing, weren't they? Oh, they're fantastic. From his XO, the legendary, he wasn't legendary yet, he was going to become legendary, Richard O'Kane. He had, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting, it's hard to remember how junior these guys were. There was a lieutenant junior grade, that's like a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps by the name of Roger Payne. He had already served on Pompano. And so even as a JG, he was, this was his second boat. Mm -hmm. He was a gunnery officer on Pompano, he was gunnery and torpedo officer on Wahoo. And then you had Lieutenant George Grider, who has previously served on an old S boat. And he was the third officer, which is the third most senior officer on the boat, which is right behind the XO. So you had, Kennedy, O'Kane, Grider, and Grider was fantastic, and he would do very well. Um, he he became a skipper himself, yeah, right? He did, yeah, yeah. I, um, and we don't want to jump too far ahead, but, um, you know, they're, they're, these officers don't serve throughout Wahoo's tenure during World War II. Most of the good ones are rotated off mm -hmm. uh, after a few patrols. And so that's going to affect the story as it evolves later. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, and that go, that that plays exactly into what we talked about in the first season. We talked about naval aviators in the United States Navy. You know, they the good ones. Well, I should. I mean, they're all good. If they got their wings of gold, they're all pretty dang good. But mm -hmm. a lot of the combat experience guys were pulled out after Midway, pulled out after Guadalcanal, what have you, and they were sent back home Becoming to teach. Structures. Exactly. Yeah. And and this is kind of the same thing here. Is that you get guys like George Grider, guys like Dick O'Kane, who become COs in their own right because of the vast amount of experience they gathered serving on Wahoo and other boats too, but but specifically this particular United States Navy submarine. Mm -hmm. Now, Marvin Kennedy, this first skipper of Wahoo, uh, as we stated previously, he was an old school submariner. And we've talked about mm -hmm. this. We've kind of bounced around it and barely touched on it here and there in different episodes. Bill, what are we talking about an old school submarine or what are, what are we talking about here? What do we mean? Yeah, the old guys, if they wanted to live, they were very conservative because submarine duty was so dangerous. Now, we talked about this a bit with the Nimitz episode. Initially, submarines had gasoline engines. Diesel engines hadn't been invented yet. And Nimitz had a hand in the ad adoption uh, re-engineering of submarines to incorporate diesel engines. That made them safer in that the engines wouldn't explode anymore like they used to, but it didn't make them safer as it pertained to submerged operations. You still had problems with valves leaking or catastrophically sometimes, or pipes leaking because we were brazing the piping instead of welding the piping because it was cheaper and easier. Um, things like that would happen. Uh, Procedures that wouldn't be executed properly, valves wouldn't be shut when the ship submerged and caused flooding. So the, the book was developed. We we the dolphin chest insignia mm. um, that I wore in our last episode in Submarine 101, um, and kind of emblem of it on my shirt, was invented before the wings of gold that Seth loves to talk about. It was the first chest insignia. You know, the submarine chest insignia before the pilot chest insignia. The other thing that was invented for submarines before they were invented for pilots was the checklist. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. submariners developed very rigorous checklists to keep from dying. <laughs> and, and pilots did as well, right? That came yeah. a bit later, not, sure. not decades later, but a bit later. But old school submariners like Kennedy lived and died by the procedure, by the checklist. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're operating nuclear submarines, it turns out they're pretty important again. <laughs> but during World War II, there was this period of time where if you're going to go through a 40-step checklist to submerge the boat, that may work in peacetime, but if you don't have it memorized and you're not willing to kind of bend a little bit when that airplane is coming over to you to drop the bomb, you're going to die. Yeah. And so yeah. the, the pendulum swung from more people dying through accidents to more people dying through combat or more people going on patrols and achieving absolutely nothing. 
mm-hmm. because the checklist didn't allow them to. Now, this is deja vu for me because when I became captain of my submarine, there was a strict adherence to checklist because the submarine had been had some problems. And I had to think of Mush Morton, what would Mush do? And think about, okay, we're going to start learning how to do things the right way. But speed is an attribute we need to be able to understand mm-hmm. and value. And mm-hmm. so we're going to learn how to do things the right way, but a different right way. Right. Just like, right. you know, Kennedy was doing it by the book. And it, it kept them alive, but not necessarily achieving the objectives that they needed to achieve in wartime. Right. And, and, and it's not to say that anything that Kennedy or that everything that Kennedy did was wrong, because it's not to your no. point. He was doing it by the book and he was the book was there. As you know, there's a movie that comes to mind and I'm going to mention it again here in a minute is the Kane Mutiny. And of course, it's a fictional yeah. story. But Captain Quig in that movie says, you know, there's four ways of doing things. There's the right way, the wrong way, the Navy way and my way. And mm-hmm. the Navy way would the way, be considered the book. We did that play when I was at the Academy and I was assistant director and Herman Woke came to see it. So I got to meet him. Oh, that's, cool. that's, a, that's a big aside. <laughs> <laughs> but Marvin Kennedy would be considered, you know, the Navy way is one way, but he would also consider things. We're going to do things my way. And it's not mm-hmm. necessarily the best way. And I say this because he was known as a slave driver. And I mean that. In all ways possible, he drove mm-hmm. his men to the point of absolute, specifically Richard O'Kane, to the point of absolute exhaustion and just they were done. He yeah, that's probably fair to say that O'Kane hated him. I think that's an understatement. Uh, and and we will <laughs> we'll see that here in a minute. And but O'Kane, but O'Kane yeah. wasn't the only one, though. You know, I mean, Marvin Kennedy was a bit of a he was a pedant, you know, he talked down to people, no matter who it was. You know, he he was he was a martinet, he was just kind of a he was kind of a tool. I'm glad you know what the word Martinet means because yes. I used that with one of my CEOs once, and he thought Martinet and Marinette were sick, the same word. And, it, and he <laughs> thought I was talking about operating like a puppet, and it wasn't. So <laughs> Martinet nope. is the right word to use for Kennedy. Good. It, is, it is very, very much so. And, you know, I say Kane Mutiny because I'm thinking of Captain Quig, and I'm not making this up. I'm reading this in books about, about him or, or where he's yeah. mentioned, and, and officers like George Greider, Roger Payne, Richard O'Kane, who all served underneath this man, mm-hmm. said he, he had some bizarre behaviors. Then again, doesn't necessarily, it's not the wrong way, but it's not the most efficient way. One of the things that he did that was just weird, he changed all of Wahoo's interior lights to red, save one. And that was yeah, in. Yeah, so there's, go ahead. there's a reason, a method to his madness. So red right. for red is what we call it. And you do that to stop to prevent from ruining your night vision, Mm -hmm. okay? And in fact, in modern submarines, well, we changed it to rig for gray because we our color screens wouldn't show red when we were rigged for red. But back in the days when we didn't have color screens, when I was a young officer, we would always rig for red at night Mm -hmm. in the control room. So it made sense to rig for red in the control room at night. The problem is if you do it all around the ship, you can't see anything. That's what you need to be able to. But most of the ship needs to be rigged for white. The control room can be rigged for red, but only at night. Right. Otherwise, you can't see anything. This was, you're right, Seth. This was crazy. It's kind of bizarre. And he did it throughout, mm. to your point, he did it from stem to stern, you know, for, so, so much yeah. so that the guys, you know, their food would look unnatural uh, colors. But this is the important thing. You, I can eat a, you know, weird, weird colored steak as long as it's cooked well, or not cooked well, medium rare is my flavor. But besides the point, <laughs> well, one of the errors, and this this caused errors, because as you know, Bill, there are valves and wheels and knobs and all kinds of stuff that are inside of a submarine that are painted a specific color. Or it a reason. What they do. And yeah. so red or not, or not does, do. does the fire main. So if you don't know where the fire main valves are, the red valves, because the rig for red doesn't, you know, hides the color of the valve, then it uh, it screws up with your ability to operate the submarine. The other thing is there's certain valve light that indicate the position of the valve. And red is bad, means the valve is open, right? Mm-hmm. And so you, you want, you know, uh, the green lights, which means everything is safe. Um, but you, it's okay if you could see the, but what if the red light burns out? You don't know it because you can't tell what the color is. Yeah. And so th- th- this was just not smart. But no, we talked it, a lot. 
enough about the red. It, it opened things up to to mistakes. And, you know, that's some of the other things that Kennedy did or did not do. He didn't allow his crew to use showers. He didn't allow his crew to wash their clothes. And keep in mind, these are salt water showers. These yeah. aren't he's not wasting fresh water here. These yeah. are salt water showers. So it's not a big deal. It adds raises the humidity level yeah. in the ship. And if you don't have air conditioning, that can be a problem. You, you know, the showers can can cause humidity to go up. But never allowing sailors to use that makes I know of no other CEO who mandated that. Doesn't make any sense. He he would use uh he he had O'Kane fashion buckets or you know something to collect the condensate from the air conditioners within the submarine and allowed the sailors to only do sponge baths, which is just mm-hmm. bizarre. I mean, submarines are naturally, you know, smelly places anyway. Can you imagine an entire crew of dudes? Well, they were called pig boats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. An entire crew of dudes not taking showers under the specific orders of the captain. I'm sure that smelled really you, good. That's right. The submarine gets smelly enough as it is, and even in my era, um, with everybody being able to take a, you know, we call submarine showers. Submarine showers, turn the water on, wet yourself really quick, turn the water off, yeah. lather up, turn the water on, rinse real quick. Turn to this day, my wife wonders how I can take a shower in three minutes. That's how. <laughs> That's how. But you know, it's not like this is using enormous amounts of water. No, and you know. But no, it's just, this makes no sense. No, it's bizarre. And, and and it's just, and these are just a few of the things. But my our whole point in all this is that it's the, the guy did some very strange things that were non-beneficial to anybody, and including himself, by the way, aboard Wahoo, and to the point where the crew absolutely detested him. And mm. it, Dick O'Kane being numero uno on that list. He worked O'Kane like a plow horse, man. It so much so. That O'Kane regularly, not all the time, but regularly missed his meals because he was doing, you know, completing the captain's orders to the point, I mean, where they just, they hated one another. When they were yeah. on, you know, on watch together for whatever reason, when they were doing things together in the same compartment, that was noticeable tension, you know, and and you do not want that. I mean, you're a skipper, Bill. You do not want no. that with your XO. No, no, no. You, you need to trust each other. You don't need to like each other, but you need to respect yeah. each other. And, you know, you need to be able to communicate because the COXO communication is probably the most important on the ship. Um, they, there was one other incident I'm, re- I'm trying to remember. Uh, I had something to do with an American destroyer. Yes. Do you remember what that was? Yes, I do. So Wahoo leaves San Francisco. She's heading mm-hmm. to Pearl Harbor for what will eventually become her first war, but she's going to Pearl. She's going to get her torpedoes and she's going to go out and do her thing. Theoretically, as she's coming into Pearl Harbor, and this is a common thing, there would all usually be an American destroyer waiting on the submarines that were coming in to escort them. Yeah. And yeah. the reason for this escort was really mainly. So those submarines would not be attacked by patrolling American aircraft because from 10,000 feet, all submarines are enemies from, you know, in terms of mm. a pilot's view. But if they're escorted by a DD, more than likely that submarine's one of ours. No attack. All right. So anyway, as Wahoo is pulling up into Pearl, near Pearl Harbor, O'Kane, through the scope, spots USS Litchfield, which is her destroyer escort. Right on time, in the right place, exact moment. Everything is lining up perfectly. Pinky Kennedy, for fear that is going to be displayed many, many times throughout his coming patrols, assumes that submarine to be Japanese, you know, rigs the boat for depth charge attack and the whole deal until after much argument from Richard O'Kane saying, if you look through the scope and you know what you're looking at, you can tell this is an American destroyer. Only then does Kennedy say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're cool. All right, let, let's surface. Let's go in the port. So it's, it's some of these little queer behaviors that he has that are just not setting up for a very good working relationship inside the submarine under times of war, as we're going to see. Yeah. Honestly, all of these personality traits would have been forgiven. Yeah. I'm I'm being truthful here. If he was successful in combat, if he showed aggressiveness and, um, and was effective, Mm -hmm. but that's not what happened, is it? It is not. So Wahoo leaves Pearl on her first patrol in August 1942, and she's deployed to the waters around Truk. 
And if you've listened to any episodes previous to this one of this podcast, you know that truck was a very important place to the Japanese, specifically the Imperial Japanese Navy. Place. That's right. The fleet basically, <clears throat> you know, most fleet assets were there. Yeah. Either there truck or remote, going yeah. in and out of truck all the time. Constantly. Right. So running on the surface the entire way to her patrol area, which is not necessarily an uncommon thing that happened, as we talked about in the last episode, Kennedy mm -hmm. ordered Wahoo once she got to the to the patrol area. And this is consistent with what you said with old school submariners, Bill. As soon as they got to the patrol area, what does he do? Blam. He dunks her down in the water smart. and keeps her there. Mm -hmm. Keeps her there all day so long. So now she's a smart mind. She yeah. needs the bad guys to run over the top of her because you can't reposition submerged. Mm -hmm. So if nobody runs over the top of her, she's not going to get anything. He he would order periscope checks every 30 minutes on the nose every 30 minutes. And at dawn and dusk, the boat would be at GQ, much like a surface vessel would be with Roger Payne, uh, the torpedo and gunnery officer on the scope for the entire 30 minutes, just basically going around in a circle. Looking no, for honestly, that's not a lot of time. I spent six hours on the scope before, so many times. <laughs> so 30 minutes doesn't break my heart. But the whole notion <laughs> that you're going to be a GQ, um, you know, for at sunrise and sunset for no good reason other than right. procedure mm -hmm. is just ludicrous. And the fact that you'd stay only raise the scope every 30 minutes because the sonars sucked. Mm -hmm. So that means you're going to miss 90% of the targets. Because if they don't happen to be within your field of view, which means inside 30,000 yards, when and, and when you raise that scope every 30 minutes, then you're going to miss them because mm -hmm. the sonar is not going to pick them up back in those days. And even submerged, unless that thing runs on top of you, you ain't going to catch it. Mm -hmm. Wahoo's first target was a small freighter. It was an unescorted target. And Wahoo picked it up at a range of 1,400 yards, 1,400 and some 1,430 yards to be exact. That's not that far, right, Bill? I mean, <laughs> that's torpedo firing range. I mean, right. you've already screwed this up because he's too close. You don't have time to set up your shot. Mm -hmm. Wahoo. But he two, did. He fired anyway. And he missed. Mm -hmm. He fired He fired three torpedoes and he, all of them missed. Um, long after they should have hit. You know, and by the way, he's firing from a submer submerged position. He and, and with the scope down. Yep. So he and fires and then lowers the scope. Fires, lowers the scope, takes her deep. He hears distant explosions long after these torpedoes should have gone off. And instead of popping the scope up to see, you know, what, what the heck was it that just went kaboom, he takes Wahoo right. even deeper and he turns away and he basically just flees mm -hmm. the scene. Mm -hmm. And this is a repeating topic here that this is a consistent thing that he does uh a lot of the other targets including her next target which was eight days later it was another small freighter um kennedy believed that he had seen an aircraft approaching which is a legitimate you know concern um and he by thinking he saw that aircraft whether it was there or not it doesn't matter he was forced to make a submerge approach he botches the approach and by the time he musters the mm -hmm intestinal strength to raise the scope and take a look that target is as you like like to say over the hill it, it, it is gone yep. yeah so, there's no way you're going to catch up if you're if you're deep or submerged at all in four thousand yards in opening yeah. so this is another opportunity lost and, and it's it's a consistent thing you know as i said you know there's several opportunities opportunities that that he has aboard wahoo that he either fails to take or screws them up most noticeably. Mm -hmm. And this is heartbreaking. Again, listen to the episodes on Guadalcanal. You'll understand how important aircraft carriers, specifically enemy, enemy aircraft carriers, were. Wahoo spotted an escort carrier, a light Japanese aircraft carrier, several days. It ran like, I think, but September 23rd, I believe. Kennedy mm -hmm. initially tried a submerged approach on a warship now, and this thing's going to be hustling it's not going to be going at five knots it's going to be making at least 15 to 20 knots reluctantly he gave into a surface approach only after okane pretty much bothered the living bejesus out of him to the point where he was like fine i'll give in i'll do what you asked me to do so he gets up there out of position completely now because he's made this long submerged approach instead of as you have demonstrated multiple times before instead of intersecting or at least 
positioning your boat to the point where you will intersect or the target will intersect you, he's running parallel to this aircraft carrier and he's botching the approach completely, just completely. And mm -hmm. Wahoo screws the pooch and misses the opportunity to at the very least damage potentially, if not sink a light Japanese aircraft carrier, which is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you're given one of these patrol orders, it tells you go to this general vicinity doesn't tell you specifically. Captain has a lot of flexibility within the general area that you've been assigned, and you stay out on this day to this day, and on this day you should start coming home. Mostly because um, you know you're going to run out of something. The assumption is you're going to run out of torpedoes, you're going to run out of food, and they build a sequence in where a new fresh submarine can come in and relieve you in that patrol area. Mm -hmm. What happens here is they run out of time. They're at the point where they're supposed to come home where he decides, I, you know, I have the opportunity to come home. And he says, OK, we're done. Yep. And returns RTB, return to base. Mm -hmm. And he's still got a bunch of torpedoes. He's still got fuel. He's still got full food. And, you know, all it would have taken is a little bit of a, a quick radio message to say, I think we should stay out here. We, we got opportunities. And mm, I don't think he. I think he knew that he was never going to get this done. So what's the point of being out here? So let's just go home. I, I would agree with that. You know, in 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 her first patrol, Wahoo does get credit for sinking one one target on September mm. 20th. I neglected to initially mention that. Uh, Kennedy fires three torpedoes at this target. They all miss. Uh, he fires one more, and it mercifully does hit and winds up, you know, taking this this vessel down. So it's a one kill mission and to your point the boat is still she's still got the stuff she needs to go out there and potentially sink more enemy ships but he says now nah, I'm, I'm good we're gonna bring her home now the the patrol reports are common knowledge if you google wahoo patrol report they come up you can read them kennedy's closing remarks on his first war patrol i'm going to read them verbatim here and and they're very very mm -hmm. telling and they go like this he says after sighting various small craft, and this is directly from the War Patrol report, suddenly on the 5th, there came into view, view Ryuo heading for the Empire, which it was not Ryuo, but that's besides the point. Had I but required a more rigorous and alert watch, we might have picked her up sooner. This is the escort or light carrier I was talking about. Had I correctly estimated the situation and made a more aggressive approach, we could have gotten in a shot. Had I taken up the surface chase with a lot, without allowing over an hour to elapse, we might not have lost the target. Had I continued the search through the rain squalls until dark, we might have picked her up again. None of these happened, and the second target proceeded unharmed. Now, this is the man's own words. He is basically crucifying himself. Yeah, he was telling the truth, and he was properly blaming himself for these mm -hmm. failures. And he's basically saying, I'm not up to this. Yeah. And you know, when you read that kind of, if I was Commodore, and I if I was his Commodore, I was Commodore once. But if I was his Commodore and I'm reading and write this stuff, I'm thinking, okay, this guy doesn't even want to be here. Yeah, he doesn't even want to be here. very clear yeah. from these words. So it was apparent, very apparent to all hands, the crew too, that Kennedy, A, was inept. B, mm. probably did not have the fortitude to be as aggressive as he needed to be and see and to your point bill didn't even want to be there mm -hmm. after arriving in pearl harbor our hero ex executive officer richard O'Kane, has he has a friend in the personnel office in pearl harbor so the boat ties up <laughs> the, the lines are barely out and O'Kane is gone he is out he is heading to that personnel office and what does he do? And this is almost unheard of at the time. It could have gotten O'Kane into some yeah, serious trouble. Is, so <clears throat> this is not good. He goes up <laughs> and tells what we would call today the N1. You need to you need to relieve my skipper. Um, if some, an XO went to say those words to the Admiral, that this would have been sub pack at the time, they might have done it. They would have done an investigation. And they might have done it, but they probably also relieved the XO mm -hmm. who made the claim that you need to relieve my skipper just out of lack of loyalty, mm -hmm. um, because that's just not done. Mm -hmm. Now, if I can tell a sea story, uh, there was one occasion when I was a junior officer 
and we were on deployment on patrol and we we had a co who started going a little bit bonkers and he would play this game called guess what i'm thinking i'd be i was off to the deck mid watch so let's say two o'clock in the morning you get the buzz from the captain's phone you pick up the phone and the captain says officer the deck guess what i'm thinking and you know you look horse speed depth targets contacts captain i i don't know what you're thinking <laughs> and it's you scream at you find yourself a relief get somebody to relieve you and come in here and see me and you get the messenger go wake somebody up have somebody wake up what's going on i don't know captain wants me to go to the stateroom and i get relieved go to the stateroom and wake and i knock on the door open the door he's sleeping there go i wake him up captain what what happened you told me to to uh, to wake you up and get a relief and come in here no i didn't yeah he says sir you did <laughs> you asked me what you were thinking and i and i didn't know you told me go get a relief in a submarine, when these things happen, there's no place to go, right? Yeah. There's no there's no way to escape the captain that you think is losing it. And so we actually approached the XO and said, XO, you need you need to report this. You need to get you somebody. Help. This is a little bit uh, like, you know, um, the Kane mutiny kind of thing, right? You need to report that this is happening and get somebody to relieve the CEO. The XO wouldn't do it. He would not do it. It turns out the CEO ended up having a heart attack underway. And apparently he'd been having these medical issues that led to his heart attack just a few weeks later. And we had to medevac him. And that's how um, we got rid of him. So these things do happen. And O'Kane crossed that threshold where he said, yeah, he did. We're, we're either going to continue to do nothing or we're all going to die because this yep. guy's incompetent and neither of those are acceptable. I'd rather get fired than allow either of those two things to happen. So he went, um, he already had a good reputation from his time on Argonaut before he became EXO of Wahoo. So he survived the event and the Navy decided to pull this guy out of PCO school and put him on Wahoo to ride to help Kennedy, quote, help. putting air quotes around the word help yep. Kennedy get through this. The interesting thing, by the way, about PCO schools, they take a photograph of each class and each class photograph is on the wall and they're numbered chronolo chronologically. So I think I was in PCO class 42. But all the PCO class photographs are on the wall, and you can go all the way back to PCO class. I'm thinking it was 16, and see Mush Morton in that photograph. I I may be wrong on the number. Maybe it was earlier than 16, but Mush Morton on that wall. That was so cool when I was at PCO school to see all these guys. You'd say we say it a hundred times, standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. We were, yeah. and seeing Mush on that wall realizing he was going to leave that class go to the wahoo as pco serve with kennedy and as i said in an earlier episode normally once if you ride a boat as pco that's not the boat you take command of you go take command of another boat but he did ride for a patrol and we'll talk about that next so to your point the okane's buddy <laughs> which is what it is says all right look fine you know i've got he O'Kane starts pouring his heart out to this cat and this guy listens and he's like, mm -hmm. all right, yeah, this guy might be not best for this situation. We're going to get yeah. somebody. O'Kane did not pick Dudley Morton. Let's be abundantly clear. It was this guy who sends Dudley Morton to Wahoo. Now Morton, not going to get totally into his background, but he was, this was his pretty much his last shot as a CO too. Mm -hmm. He had, he'd done some things and said some things and, irritated the wrong people to the point where if he doesn't get a, a command on this try, he's going to the service fleet. Mm -hmm. Besides that, Dudley Walker Morton, legendary person, legendary skipper, hero by all accounts, born in Kentucky, raised in Miami, Florida. He was a graduate graduate of the Academy, like all sub skippers were class of 1932. Mm -hmm. He was a, Big old dude. He was a football player. I think he was a wrestler at the academy too. Yeah. He, he was a big, 
big boy. He loved to roughhouse with officers and enlisted men aboard his ship. Yeah, this would not pass today. Not today. <laughs> yeah, to- he would he would uh he would grab sailors and just wrestle them to the ground to the deck. And it was just, you know, this is the kind of thing guy he was. Yeah, he was he was he had this infectious personality that everybody who ever served with him said you could be talking about the most mundane depressing thing when morton entered the room he didn't even have to say a word when he entered the room the room just illuminated you know people were just like oh hey mush what's going on i mean he just had this personality that was infectious he was he you was know, the other thing is he let he let the crew call him mush yeah. instead of cat that's yeah. another thing that just isn't done he Maybe was one of the guys. Heard of that. Yeah. yeah, he was one of the guys, and you know, <laughs> he he was a clown too. He demonstrated, mm-hmm. and this is funny. He demonstrated his bar trick of stuffing four golf balls in his mouth and still being able to talk. And that's you would try to be very yeah. serious, sincere, and give a pep talk to the crew with four golf balls in his mouth. Yeah. He was a goofball. Yeah, but they loved him. They, yeah. the, the the officers and men alike worshipped the ground that he walked on. They absolutely loved this guy. And he wasn't even you a skipper. Find a guy, yeah, you couldn't find a guy more different from Kennedy than, than Mush Morton. Just no. they were polar opposites. Yep. And that's one of the reasons I think the crew liked him. Oh, yeah, probably. Well, that now, and he's just the, a good dude. You, know, the, you described him, the word you would use is gregarious, right? He really mm-hmm. loves people and people love him back. I've known some gregarious leaders in my Navy career that the, they were, the gregariousness was covering up their lack of actual skill. Mm-hmm. So you know, people liked them, but boy, they were, you know, they didn't have the talent yeah. that they should have had. And, and the gregariousness was, was used to hide the lack of talent. This was not much Morton. He was gregarious and talented. Absolutely. He gets aboard Wahoo for, for this is Wahoo's second patrol as her, as her PCO, as you said. Mm-hmm. And he immediately bonds. I mean, within hours, uh, bonds with the crew. He bonds with the officers, especially Dick O'Kane. He and, he and O'Kane are like kindred spirits. They, they yeah. instantly become best friends. And this is dangerous, Seth, because the, per procedure, he's not going to become the Wahoo's CO. Yeah, he's going to go to some other boat, right. and these guys ended up getting so attached to him, and they were going to be heartbroken when and if he was transferred to be captain of another boat, and they would get the guy that was best that they were destined to get. Right. Right. So when they bonded with him like that, they were taking a big risk because you know, he's likely to not be there. Yeah. But yeah, right. Mm-hmm. They, they were destined to be together. Mush Morton and Wahoo were destined to be together. So they go out on their second patrol. Morton as PCO. It's the ship's yep, second patrol, war right, patrol. Right. With Kennedy still as CO right. and Morton as the PCO. Right. Absolutely. So the second patrol is about as uneventful as the first patrol. Uh, you know, a week after entering her patrol area, Wahoo sighted what appeared to be a convoy on a moonless, stormy night. Now, Bill, as a submarine skipper, you know that a moonless, stormy night, that's probably about the best time to attack on the surface, if nothing else. They ain't going to yeah. see you. Right. right. O'Kane suggested a night surface attack to Kennedy, who immediately said, not no, but hell no, because he mm-hmm. that's just not how it was done. That's just not it how. It wasn't in the procedure. It wasn't in the book. You conducted all attacks submerged, right? Yep. Wahoo submerges, <laughs> misses the convoy. O'Kane is seething because he could. They could see this convoy, and he's like, we're going on the surface. We can yeah. light these guys up. He plunks they her down in the water. It. They mm. keep on cruising, and O'Kane is about to lose his mind. You guys are going to get sick of hearing me say this. They're now a smart mind. Mm-hmm. And they are. Well, not even that. They're just there. <laughs> they're they're uh-huh. not even going to get anything. Well, these ships aren't going to run over the top of them. They're not going to be able to do anything. Nope. So later, Wahoo cites another convoy actually does succeed in sinking one of the freighters, an act that inspired the crew, if only momentarily. Wahoo also takes her fir- first depth charging during this action. Uh, some 78 depth charges are dropped on Wahoo. And that's a lot of ash cans that are floating over the side of those DDs. Yeah. Um, over the next several days, Wahoo spots numerous targets, all of which were either improperly approached 
or were refused to attack by Kennedy at all. Kennedy, you know, he would be given the contact by O'Kane or Payne or whoever. And then Kennedy like, no, nah, nah, we're not. No, it's not, not important enough. No, we're not going to attack that one. No, it's yeah. not a big enough target. Yeah, yeah. And it just, you can always come up with a reason not to do it. Over and over and over again. Similar to the first patrol, Wahoo, still flush with food, fuel, and torpedoes, is pulled out of patrol by Kennedy, and now he brings her into Australia. And this is important for two reasons. One, when he pulls into Pearl Harbor on her first patrol, Pearl Harbor area submarines are under the command of Admiral English, who was mm -hmm. Kennedy's so buddy at the time. Yeah, he mm -hmm. was Kennedy's buddy. When you pull the submarine into Australia, you are no longer under the umbrella of Admiral English. You are under the umbrella of Admiral Charles Lockwood. Uh, and, yeah, Lockwood worked for English at the time, but but Lockwood is the immediate commander. So right. you're right. So Lockwood has uh, operational control and administrative control of the ship. And with the administrative control, he's able to leave Kennedy. Mm -hmm. But he's just learning about this from, again, Dick O'Kane. Yep, yep. So once in Brisbane, they pull up in Brisbane. Kennedy is, as I said, he's out from Admiral English's umbrella or what have you. And in a post-patrol conversation, uh, to your point, Bill, O'Kane goes up to, I don't, I don't think he goes to Lockwood, but he goes to the Commodore and basically starts ranting and raving again yeah, about, about right. Kennedy. And Morton accompanies Kennedy on the post patrol report because he's PCO. That's what he's supposed to do. Yeah, you do a post patrol brief. Tell, so he, tell the admiral what, what happened, right? So he goes in there. Kennedy's done. He gives his patrol report, the whole, you know, smoke and mirrors and dog and pony show and all that stuff. He walks out of the room. Morton stays there. The Commodore asks Morton, he says, What is your opinion of both the patrol? Now he's heard. Clearly, the Commodore's heard from O'Kane. He's heard the rumors. He asks Morton, he says, what is your opinion of the patrol and the skipper? <laughs> and, and what does Mush mm -hmm. say? Commodore, he's a yellow-bellied son of a bitch and ought to be relieved. If you doubt my word, call the exec and ask him. To which the Commodore calls <laughs> O'Kane in again and says, yep. what's the poop? And, and O'Kane just lays it on the line. Not surprisingly, yeah. Kennedy's relieved. Yeah. The Commodore would go to Admiral Lockwood and tell him, look, I think I need to relieve the skipper. The Commodore's not going to do that without talking to the Admiral. Right. But then Lockwood, yeah, let's, you know, what are we going to do, though? We don't have any, we don't have the PCO for Wahoo in here. And the Commodore would say, yeah, but we got mush. Yeah. He rode already. He rode the patrol. He's right here. He's available in case of glass, you know, in case of emergency break glass kind of guy. Yep. And so yep. Lockwood approved it and Morton took command. Yep. Morton takes command on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1942. Uh, Wahoo's new, new captain is now Dudley Walker Mush Morton. Mm -hmm. Together, those two are going to go down in history. Once Morton takes command, he orders that Kennedy's Japanese, and this is, this is kind of comical, Kennedy put silhouettes, silhouette pictures of Japanese vessels all through the boat. And so he wanted every yeah, I talked crew. In the last, right. I talked in the last episode about having flashcards for recognition training, where you flash up the silhouette of different classes of ships, and you immediately need to recognize what the class was and mm -hmm. know what the masthead height was. Mm -hmm. So Kennedy put these silhouette cards all over the boat for recognition training. Mm -hmm. And Mush said, yeah, screw those. Take those things down. Um, I think Betty Grable would look really good there. <laughs> he goes into his sea bag and he pulls a stack of pictures out about an inch and a half thick, hands it to one pin of the crewmen, girls. pin up girls, and says, put these get that crap out of my boat and put these all over the damn place. Mm -hmm. That's going to liven up any 18-year-old boy. I'm sorry. Well, at least it's a physical manifest manifestation that things are going to be different going forward, changing. right? Yep. Immediately. If he wants to send a sign. That's it. Yep. Immediately rips out all the red lights that aren't, you know, battle necessary. 
reinstalls the, the the proper lighting within the submarine, allows the crew to take showers for crying out loud and wash their clothes. He tells uh, Wahoo's uh, yeoman, a, a gentleman by the name of Forrest Sterling, who wrote a fantastic book called Wake of the Wahoo, by the way, that is a must read. Uh, he tells Sterling, he says, quote, lose the captain's mast book. We won't be needing it on my boat. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just that's without even. I mean, he had literally taken command like an hour before, and he says, I trust everybody here. We're going to do things the right way. Get rid of that. We don't need that. Mm. The crew, as you said, they call him Mush. He he strides through the boat in his skivvies or with a robe on, doesn't he? He's, yeah, if it was a little cold, he would put a bathrobe over his skivvies. But yeah, I mean, it's hot yeah. in the tropics on yeah. a submarine, even with the air conditioning. It didn't work very well. Yeah. And so, yeah, he walked around in his skivvies. Um, cr- you know, he had a smoke a cigar, and he would have that cigar in his mouth all the time, walking around in skivvies, maybe with a bathrobe flapping behind him. <laughs> he, he was he was a unique, unique individual. That's a good way to describe him. And the crew, like I said before, they absolutely adored him. They absolutely loved him. Uh, Yeoman Sterling said to Morton, he says, quote, Captain, you give the word and I'll follow you to the bottom of the sea, sir. And Morton apparently replied to him, well, you might just do that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, sadly, sadly. And before they left for Australia, this is I, I referenced this, I think, in the last episode um, when I talked about the casualty fatality rate in the submarine force. Morton did give a crew a pep talk. Mm-hmm. And then you can say, what? And his pep talk consisted of these words, Wahoo is expendable. Our mission is to sink enemy shipping. We're going we're gonna to go out there and search for Japs. Every smoke trace on the horizon, every contact on watch will be investigated. If it turns out to be the enemy, we're going to hunt him down and kill him. Now, if anyone doesn't want to go along under these conditions, just see the yeoman. I'm going to give him verbal authority now to transfer anyone who is not a volunteer. Nothing will ever be said about you remaining in Brisbane. And he gave them 30 minutes to decide whether they were going to stay on board or ship out. Yep. Yeah. Not, not a single man walked off of that submarine after having served under Kennedy and his mm. less than brave approaches to submarine warfare you got this fire eater standing on your deck saying we're going to go out there and we're going we're going the taxpayers are going to get their money's worth out of this submarine mm-hmm. and if you want to stay well, help let's you roll understand that though seth going to sea in a submarine is inherently dangerous sure. by itself right when you go do that and you realize we're never going to sink anything why am i risking my life going to sea in a submarine right. when there will be no payoff for it that that's demoralizing and then a guy comes along and says we're gonna go kill the enemy now people say okay now that's worth risking my life over yep so it becomes an easier decision yep because they know they're gonna get some payback and you know it's gonna help the war effort that's why they're there you know it's why Mm -hmm. they volunteer for the sub service in the first dang place not just for the extra pay it was because this is what they wanted to do so Morton, as you said, he gives him 30 minutes. He goes back to the yeoman Sterling and he says, any takers? And Sterling replied in the negative. And Morton says, quote, that's the stuff I like in a crew. We're going to sink some Jap ships on this trip. And boy, yeah. do they. Innovative in his style. And you talked about this the last episode, Bill. Morton just instinctively, A, loved O'Kane. I don't want to say liked. He loved O'Kane. They were Thicker than thieves. They were best buddies. But he trusted O'Kane. And he trusted O'Kane because O'Kane, he Morton had a very good judge of character. He had a very good judge of people, very good judge of skill set. He could recognize that O'Kane was going to be, even though O'Kane had not been, well, he had not been on a scope under fire. He'd been under fire, but he'd not been in a scope under fire. He could see that O'Kane was going to be a cool customer. And O'Kane mm-hmm. had, to, and we talked about this before too, he had this trigonometric mind that could figure out all these sines and cosines and all the stuff that you were talking about in his head in seconds. And just yeah. how his brain worked was 
frankly, to my brain, mind boggling. He knows this. And that, Go ahead. That's not optional, right? You've got to be able to do that. Um, there are two things. If you stop doing it, you're going to get worse at it. One is weapons accuracy, you know, smiling, firing small arms and things like that. When you stop practicing, the accuracy of your firing gets degrades over time. And the second thing you've got to do is you've got to practice this. We call it mental math. You've got to practice doing these calculations in your head with these memorized cosine tables and things like that. And if you start out not good at it, you're you're going to degrade from that low level of performance and you're going to continue to be not good at it. So, you know, O'Kane had this wonderful mind, like you said, O'Kane could do it. Morton realized that wasn't a strength. So he put O'Kane on the scope during approaches and made him, we call it today, the assistant opera, um, approach officer back then. O'Kane called it himself in his book, the co-approach officer. I think that's a little grand, but uh, that, that was essentially his role working for Morton. Yeah, which is which is revolutionary because as you said, Bill, that was not done. You know, it might have been done once or twice to say, hey, exec, you know, look up in the scope, take a picture, you know, but that was not done under wartime. Certainly never would have been done under Kennedy's command. Mm -hmm. On January 16th, just 16 days after receiving command of Wahoo, Wahoo departs uh, Brisbane for her third patrol. Destination and orders were to recon Weewak Harbor near New Guinea, middle of nowhere harbor in New Guinea. They didn't have a dang map of the place. Uh, one of uh, I can't that Dalton Keeter, I believe, one of Wahoo's sailors happened to buy a children's atlas for his children when he got back to the states, and lo when and behold, when they were in Australia, yeah. and lo and behold, there's a map of the coast of New Guinea with Weewak Harbor. That's how they found the place because oh, it, they couldn't it find it. Had a small, small indication of where Weewak Harbor might be. Right. This was not a harbor chart. No. This was <laughs> this is. Like a dot on the map saying we whack. <laughs> so this was like, and it, so to, to understand this recon, which was their mission, I've done it a dozen times. You're just kind of looking at the beach and taking photos sure. in case there's an amphibious landing later. And that's what the whole point, trying to find breakers, what might represent a reef, things like that, right? And if there were the indentations in the shoreline, right. are there built up facilities. That's what the word recon means when you're a submariner. But that's not how Morton <laughs> interpreted the word recon. Nope. What did he do, Seth? Much Morton interpreted the, <laughs> interpreted the word recon to sink anything that floated. Because, I mean, to his point, well, that's what they're out there for. He also, he, right. But he, what he took it to mean is penetrate the harbor. That's yeah. different than recon. Yeah. So entering the harbor isn't reconning the beach or reconning the harbor. It's penetrating the harbor and going looking for ships to sink. And so it's a very liberal interpretation. And if he if they would have screwed this up, oh, he dead. would have been fired. He would have been well, they, for cause. Yeah. But and, and let me put this into perspective here. This isn't like, you know, Boston Harbor. 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. It's not where you pull up and you can you can, you know, drive There's your submarine in there. Yeah. It ain't like right. that. It's a nine mile drag into Weewak Harbor from the coast of New Guinea. Nine miles. I mean, so that's running submerged, running submerged in the daylight in a shallow mm -hmm. draft harbor. He he pulls this thing. He pulls Wahoo into the friggin' harbor. Pops up scope. Okane's on the scope. What does he see? A Japanese destroyer later later identified as the Harasame. Right. I think he saw several ships nested, oh, he did. and one he of did. them was destroyer, right? He nested did. means they're they're moored to each other, right? Mm -hmm. Turning the scope, uh, he he he. Actually, I, I was wrong. Morton actually pops the scope, looks through, sees the targets, and goes, ah, "Here we go." He gives the scope to yeah. O'Kane from three thousand yards away. The destroyer, the Haru Harasame, was actually she was preparing to get underway anyway. Um, she starts moving. She's coming out of the yeah. harbor. And from 3,000 yards, the destroyer begins getting underway, happens to be heading in Wahoo's direction. O'Kane sighted in on the target, called out bearings, and Morton said, coolly, anytime, Dick. <laughs> anytime, Dick. Anytime, Dick. <laughs> anytime, Dick. We know it's a destroyer. We know it's coming at us. And Dick's getting those 
bearings exactly right, yep. range exactly right. He wants to make this good. Of course, the destroyer doesn't know they're there yet. Yet. Anytime, Dave. He fires three torpedoes. Fire three torpedoes. <laughs> Go ahead. Yep. You he take it from here. He fires three torpedoes. The destroyer immediately sees these torpedoes come because they're close and zigs away. Yeah. Boom. Mark and 14s. He, can you imagine what that destroyer skipper's thinking? He's like, what in the hell? You know, because all of a sudden there's an American coming? submarine. There. Yeah. Where the hell is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Speeds increased on the destroyer to 18 knots, and O'Kane looked at Morton for orders. <laughs> Morton casually said, quote, leave your scope up and we'll shoot that son of a bitch down the throat, unquote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the instinct is going to be to drop the scope. Yeah. Try to reposition a little bit before you raise it again. Hope that he runs past you or something like that. But leave it up. That's that's a gutsy move. Not much more than them. At, at a mm -hmm. range of 1,250 yards and closing, Morton again said, Anytime, Dick. Anytime, Dick. Wahoo fired her <laughs> last loaded torpedo, bow torpedo, at a range yeah. of 750 yards. So this thing is moving quick. This destroyer is moving fast. Mm -hmm. At this, then Morton says, all right, take her down. She plunges for the bottom when throughout the sub. It's from deep. Say again? They're on a harbor. The bottom is not deep. No. They're on a harbor. No. As she noses down, they hear a tremendous explosion. Very evidently, the torpedo hit. Uh, pandemonium. I think they might have. They might have thought at first, "Oh, oh, we're getting death charged." I don't know that they knew immediately that the, the torpedo had hit. It, it, it's it's regardless of what it is. O'Kane mm -hmm. or not O'Kane? Morton orders. I'm going to get the names confused because of their close relationship. The way that things of course throughout yeah. this, mm -hmm. but Morton orders bring her back up, pop up the periscope. Let's see what see what that was, which is something that Kennedy did not do. Morton brings her up. Pops the scope. One of the more famous pictures of World War II is taken by Wahoo's yeah. periscope. It's Harrison. By the way, it's not beached. easy to take these photos. You got to take the eyepiece off the scope, mount a camera on it. So it's not like you press a button and it takes a picture. So it's pretty involved and you got to leave the scope up too long because you can only do that with the scope up. So that famous photo of the Hawasame sinking, I think its bow is already submerged yeah. when the photo has been taken. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably going to show it. Oh, I will. Yeah, absolutely show it. Yeah. It's it's uh it it Wahoo gets credit for the sinking, although mm -hmm. I guess technically it does sink because they beach it up on the shore. However, Same does later see action. She does not go down, never she to see action. Yeah. She does get refloated. Mm -hmm. Regardless of this, it's a down the throat torpedo shot that for that time not kills that destroyer. Less than a thousand yards. Yep. Crazy. First time <laughs> in the Pacific War that that happened. First mm. time that a submarine, United States submarine, penetrated an enemy harbor. And this mm. ain't the last of the first that Wahoo will will do here. On January 26, just I believe it was four or five days later, uh, Wahoo sighted the masts of what appears to be a convoy. Uh, as the convoy approaches Wahoo, she swung her stern tubes at the two visible ships and fired, hitting the Fouquet Maru with two fish and the Pacific Maru with one fish. So Wahoo is, for the first time, really attacking a significantly sized Japanese convoy. Um, a prematurely fired torpedo caused the Buyo Maru, which is another ship. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, as Morton swings the boat around uh, to finish off the two cripples with his stern tubes, um, O'Kane sees another ship coming over the horizon. This is the Buyo Maru, B U Y O Maru. Uh, Morton fire. Maru is a designation given to any merchant ship, by the way. So these, right. these are all, you know, merchants of all some merchants. form, freight or um, things like that. A prematurely fired torpedo, and this is basically, it was an accidental discharge. He accidentally hit the, the fire button and Torpedo goes out, uh, caused the Buyo Maru to swing over. She sees a torpedo coming. She presents her broadside to Wahoo. Two torpedoes fired by Wahoo stops Buyo Maru in her tracks. The pre previously hit Pacific Maru was charging Wahoo. So Wahoo hits one of these submarine or one of these ships and damages it, but doesn't sink it. Uh, this mm -hmm. Pacific Maru decides it sees Wahoo, it sees the periscope, and it's going to charge and try and ram and kill this American submarine that's just knocked out two and damaged my ship. 
um, the, the Maru is charging Wahoo to ram when O'Kane fires two more fish. One is a dud. One is a premature mm-hmm. explosion. And this is something you'll hear over and over and over and over again. Diving, Wahoo escaped harm and fired two more fish at the Buyo Maru. One was a dud and the other one finally blew a huge hole in her side. The Pacific Maru that was attempting to ram Wahoo passes over top of her and keeps on chugging away at a speed of about 10 knots. When Morton, true to his word of sinking Japanese ships, decides to surface and run this sucker down. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he had a saying, um, Dick, stay with the bastards until they're on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And he, he would say this repeatedly. And he, he he was very adamant about that and very true yeah. to his word. As he surfaces Wahoo, everybody, all, you know, the officers get up on the bridge. O'Kane and Morton are on the bridge uh, the, outside um, on the surface boat. O'Kane sees the mass of another Japanese ship on the horizon. Morton decides, you know what? We can chase these suckers down because they're only doing about 10 knots or so. Let's take a break. Let's eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so he orders his crew to have chow again. I mean, just as cool of a customer as you could possibly get mm-hmm. as he and Morton, as he, as he and O'Kane are eating lunch, they plot a course to intercept the two retreating targets that are now going over the horizon. Uh, at this time, Morton could not help, but notice there are about 20 odd lifeboats in the water around the Buyo Maru. And this is very important here because there's a, there's some controversy about Mush Morton for this coming procedure here that goes through. And we can talk about that, and we will. Wahoo goes to battle station surface. Morton stated, quote, I'll put a single four-inch round through the largest boat. Machine guns, it'll be your job to chase them out of the boats. Chief Carr, you smash up the boats. No, um, end quote. Nowhere does he say, I'm going to kill every single guy in these boats. It's in the water. Yeah, and he never says that. There are certain accounts that say he did say that, but these are three accounts that are pretty much verbatim that says he never said that. this This is what he's going to do. He's trying to chase these people out of the boats, leaving them to the mercy of the sea. Yep. I think he did say there were thousands of men in the water or in these boats. Um. So he knew the magnitude. This wasn't just a few. And he also knew, he also believed they were soldiers who would end up fighting us if they didn't, right? if we didn't do something to leave them to the mercy of the sea, as right. he said. Exactly. He, he assumed that every single person aboard this Japanese ship was a Japanese soldier. They're in the vicinity of New Guinea, that these guys are going to go to New Guinea and they're going to fight our boys are at the very or the Australians or somebody Still Americans or Australians. Right. Yeah. Yep. So he wants to get rid of them. Unfortunately, about 300 or so of these people in the water were actually Indian prisoners of war. They were not all Japanese as Wahoo draws near to the floating boats. She receives fire from the Japanese who were in some of these lifeboats, some of the bigger lifeboats at that Morton and immediately mostly pistol fire. It's interesting to me that their pistols actually worked while they were, and some of them were in boats, right? So right, they were right. dry. But still, I mean, you got to mm-hmm. have a you got to have a set of cojones to take a shot at the submarine with a pistol, or or or, <laughs> or even if you got a machine gun, even if you got an ambu, which some some officers on Wahoo mm-hmm. said that they got machine gun fire, whether they did or they didn't, who knows? It's mm-hmm. it's irrelevant, frankly. But they shot at them, and by doing mm-hmm. that, that's the only excuse Morton needed. It's like, oh. You've, <laughs> You want some of this? Fine. And he orders that four-inch gun to fire around. I'm going to shoot at you. And you're dang right he is. And he's going to lay it into him, which is what he does. Um, He orders a four-inch gun to open fire on the largest boat, punches a hole right through it, drives the Japanese, who and these were Japanese, out of the boat, into the water. Shortly after that, theoretically, a burst of Japanese fire, be it machine gun fire, pistol fire, what have you, doesn't matter, uh, strikes Wahoo. Basically, it ricochets off the bridge a little too close for comfort for the officers up there on the bridge and at that morton says nope this ain't happening and he orders his machine guns and the 20 millimeters to open fire on the boats themselves um okane said that the machine gun fire was methodical quote sweeping through the japanese like a hose spraying the street end quote 
they're close. I don't know how close. I don't think there's any record. And Bill, maybe you know. I, I don't. Know. I think they drove through the this through the middle of them while they yeah. were shooting at them. They didn't stand off. They're actually the, these survivors were in the water be, in between where what where Wahoo was and where they wanted to go. Yeah. So and they ended up kind of driving through and shooting at them as they drove through. Yeah. So Morton and O'Kane, that's that's too damn close, by the way. But but Morton yeah. and O'Kane later claimed that thousands of Japanese were in the water, to your point, Bill. Post war records state that there were 1,126 men aboard Buyo Maru and some 491 Indian prisoners of war. 195 Indians and 87 Japanese were killed. Now, before anybody has a coronary, there's no record that says that any of these people and we we're going to assume that a lot of them were killed by machine gun fire but there's no we don't know how many were killed by machine gun fire we don't know how many were wounded when the ship got sunk we don't know how many were killed by the japanese while they were and i'm talking about the indians now trying to get aboard boats because there were statements later by the indian prisoners of war who did survive that any indian who tried to get aboard one of the pieces of wreckage that was floating was with either beaten to death clubbed to death stabbed or shot, shot by the japanese when the Japanese came to, see, go ahead. They were in worse physical condition to begin with because oh, of the way yes. the Japanese treated the POWs. So they were gonna, there was going to be a higher death rate among the Indian POWs than the Japanese, regardless if nobody fired a shot. Absolutely, absolutely. And needless to say, the Japanese did not go out of their way to rescue as many Indian prisoners of war as they did their own countrymen. I understand. Absolutely, it's it's a war. You know, I'm not making excuses for Morton or the Japanese. It is what it is. Not finished, Morton orders Wahoo to take after the two Japanese ships on the horizon. So he's just laid waste to a couple of ships, damaged a couple of more, shot up these boats, and now he's now going after the two Japanese ships that are trying to get away. What does he do, Bill? He he winds up catching them. Yeah, he does, you know, and he ends up sinking, I think, uh, what he called a run and gun battle. In fact, mm -hmm. he sent a message to Sub Pack saying, Sank a destroyer in Wewak Sunday. And in a 14 hour running and gunning battle, torpedo battle today, sank a convoy of one tanker, two freighters, and one transfer, transport destroying their boats. Torpedoes expending, proceeding Pearl Harbor. That is exactly the message <laughs> that. that I'm <laughs> sub back wanted to hear because to this point, there had never been a submarine patrol like this from the United no. States Pacific fleet boat. Nothing like that. And this. it turns out, even though he was running to Pearl Harbor, he wasn't finished. He had no more torpedoes, but he finds another Japanese convoy yep. and says, okay, I'm going after them with a deck gun. Yep. This is crazy. Nuts. And, the issue is, as you want, might, might expect, it didn't go. The Japanese ships had bigger guns than he did. Yeah, did. So the Japanese yeah. escorts chased the Wahoo off with several close calls, and Morton sends another message. Remember, he said, torpedoes expended you know, in a run-and-gun battle. Right. Well, this time, he says, another run-and-gun battle today. Wahoo running, destroyer gunning. <laughs> which is absolutely hilarious. Yeah. So he sent humorous messages out about near-death experiences that the ship had. He had some so panache, no as we say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, so he, when he get, comes back to Pearl, he I think it was February 7th, yep. um, he comes into a hero's welcome. Now, keep in mind, Seth properly characterized the submarine force as the silent service. And part of that was... They didn't talk about their victories. They didn't talk about their people. They didn't talk about anything. It was like Admiral King wrote the doctrine for submarines, which is don't talk to the press. Just when you tell them when the war's over, tell them we we'll want. Right. That's what the submarine force had been doing to this point. But suddenly you have one guy who succeeds where so many others have not done so well, either failed or come nowhere near the number of ships they sunk in. Morton's first war patrol. Mm -hmm. So he comes in, he says, this guy's a hero. Sub pack, I think it's still Admiral English at this point. This guy's a hero. Um, and of course, when the ship pulls in, they've got the broom tied to the periscope, which signifies clean sweep, 
which means every one of your torpedoes is expended and effectively. Doesn't mean everyone hit, but expended effectively. And he had a long pennant emblazoned with one of Morton's many um, phrases, yep. shoot the sons of bitches. <laughs> and so the sub pack decides this guy's a hero. We have yeah. heroes we've already talked about from Guadalcanal who were paraded around the country for war bond efforts and things like that. That would happen throughout the war, even from Iwo Jima. But holy cow, our first true legend is being born before our very eyes. We ought to make this public. Yep. And for the first time, the submarine force was willing to talk about one of their successful COs. Yep. And he well, became a legend. He was on newspaper, you know, front pages of papers and things like that. Go ahead, Seth. To, 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 to your point, it was also the first time that the United States Navy had a successful submarine skipper. <laughs> Yeah. Of of well, any, I don't yeah. want to say completely, right. but of to this degree, at this yeah. point on one patrol now. Now, granted, yeah, she'd right. sunk two other ships previously, but on this one patrol, mm -hmm. Wahoo immediately becomes the highest scoring submarine in the U.S. Pacific Fleet under the command mm -hmm. of Dudley Walker Morton, and a and guy who happens to be boyish and a goofball and, yeah. and gregarious and willing to smile at the camera. Man, he was he was a PA public affairs wonder. Oh yeah. And 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 let's be clear here. He was he did not do this kind of thing on purpose. He wasn't a publicity hound. He was not the kind of guys like, look at me. He didn't do that. That's no. just how he was. Like he was just generally a he was good himself. dude. Yeah, he was just a good dude. And he had that magnetic personality that you just you loved him when you met him. And mm -hmm. he wasn't putting on a show. You know, as mm. MacArthur or Halsey or other people, Pappy Boeington would do, mm. this was his real personality. He was there. Mm. This is him. This is what you see is what you get. It his his natural charm endeared him not only to his crew and to the officers above him. Admiral, you know, eventually, obviously, Admiral Lockwood came to absolutely adore Morton, but mm. he, you know, eventually he goes back home. And we'll talk about this in a minute. And, you know, he's a hero to the press. They send him to Hollywood, which he actually already had connections in Hollywood. But he goes to Hollywood. One of my favorite movies, Destination Tokyo, submarine movie. Mm -hmm. Great Morton, movie. It is. Morton is credit. He's uncredited, but he was a technical advisor on that movie to Cary Grant. There's pictures of Morton and Cary Grant standing there on the set of Destination Tokyo. So, I mean, this dude was made out to be a big hero. And much like all true American heroes... He's like, I don't want any of this garbage. I want to go back out to sea with my people. And that's exactly what he does. On the fourth patrol, the fourth patrol is almost as important as an, and impressive as the third patrol. The third patrol is impressive because it's yeah. Morton's first one. The fourth patrol is actually even more successful. Why he, he, he thinks nine ships in this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nine ships in his fourth patrol, in his, in his second patrol as skipper, Wahoo's fourth patrol. They go out to the Yellow Sea, which is way out there. I mean, Bill, that's you know, it's very shallow too. And the problem with that is that you can't go deep to run away from those depth charges or those airplanes that might sight you because mm -hmm. you've got to run you know, no deeper than 150 feet. So, you know, that's incredible. It, it's, it's, it was a good place for hunting because the Japanese thought they were kind of Safe. invulnerable yeah. Yellow Sea. Um, that's west of Korea, obviously. And of course, Korea was a Japanese, um, you know, territory, slave state. Oc yeah, occupied slaves, zone. Yeah, more than a territory, <laughs> slave yeah. state. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. so they would go in there and, and he, he had a field day in the LOC, which again has a, if and when we do a later episode on uh, Flucky, we could talk about the LOC again, but mm -hmm. just, um, so just some really remarkable things. But he was faced on this patrol, I think more than his first one, with a bunch of misses because of defective torpedoes. Mm -hmm. um, so he twice he surfaced after his torpedoes didn't work and engaged Japanese ship with his deck guns. Mm -hmm. He's just so frustrated. Yep. And unlike more politically savvy CEOs who had a little bit of delicacy as they communicated, you know, failings to their superiors that their superiors might be responsible for 
he was furious. Yes, he was. And he unleashed. At this time, Lockwood, I think, was was in Pearl Harbor. Admiral right. English had died by this point, and Lockwood became sub pack And he would just unload on Admiral Lockwood about the torpedo fans, its failures. And since Lockwood had become such a big fan of Morton, and they'd made him Morton fairly famous, mm-hmm. the last thing they wanted was Morton going out there and talking to the press about how our torpedoes sucked. Mm-hmm. So Lockwood really turned up the heat on trying to get these things fixed. Which eventually they do, but to the point where, to your point, you know, Wahoo under Morton, Morton was so driven, and this is something we need to talk about too, you know, and this goes mm-hmm. back to the shooting of the of the people in the water. And, and I think we need to touch on this because if we don't, we'll be crucified for it, that he was so driven to do his job that he would mm-hmm. do whatever needed to be done to the point of putting himself and his boat in harm's way, probably unnecessarily. Uh, several times to get that job get that. done he was so driven to sink japanese ships whatever they were to mm. eliminate and kill as many of the as many of the enemy as humanly possible by his hands to in his mind which is true shorten the war the more people he kills mm. the more ships he sinks the faster this war is going to be over these people attack my country and they are going to pay that is how the man thought that's how right. he rationalized every single thing he did. And he was so bent on getting that job done that he started to drive himself to the point of absolute physical and mental exhaustion. After mm-hmm. the fourth war patrol, uh, to your point, Morton was flown. So Wahoo pulls into Midway after her fourth war patrol, which is, by the way, was the most successful patrol of an American submarine for over a year until it was broken by whom? His XO, Dick O'Kane. That's right. His, who became CEO of Tang. Yep. Yep. So that uh, relationship continued for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. He is flown from Midway to Pearl Harbor to personally debrief Admiral Lockwood. And to your point again, Bill, this is where he just blows up. And he says, you know, if you're ordering me, if you people are ordering me and my crew out to the farthest reaches of the empire, you need to give us weapons that friggin' work. That work. Yeah. He's and, right. And he's, yeah, I mean, I mean, you can't blame the man. I mean, he's putting his life and his crew's life at risk, and they're using crappy tools, man. And and that's just, yeah. it's it's unfair. It is not fair. And to the point that you were talking about, he was so irritated and so driven by that fact of sinking enemy ships that he would routinely surface Wahoo and gun down the Japanese ships and sampans that he was unable to sink because of his crappy torpedoes. Mm-hmm. Fifth patrol, fifth patrol, Wahoo goes out. And this is, I believe. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit. Wahoo's fifth patrol. She goes out. This is the last one where he has Richard O'Kane as his executive officer. And this That's is right. very, very important here. It's less successful. He sinks three sub. Three, sub try again. Three sinks three ships, <laughs> mm-hmm. but that's not to Morton's standards. That's not that's like way below his standards. That's successful for other people. That's a failure for Mush Morton. Yeah, that's an that's an A for everybody else. That's an F for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it 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 drives him to the point where he's he's pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Wahoo now goes home. She goes to the United States. This is where he gets into the movie, the, the Destination Tokyo and all that jazz. Mar- Mar- Island, yeah. And and O'Kane leaves the boat to take command Becomes of the U.S. Yo, Tang, about he, to be commissioned. And that's a Baleo submarine, not a, I think, and not a yeah, Gato, it is. But go ahead. Yeah, no, you're right. You're 100% right. The fact that O'Kane leaves, you know, of course you could sit here and pontificate for hours, but – it it had to have done something to Morton. This is his best buddy. I mean, this isn't just some yeah. you know exit. This is not another. Shared this all is the his success. Yeah. yeah, shared all the successes. They talked about things together all the time. Their families knew one another. Buddy, they had a procedure. They had a process yeah. that worked. They were they a had team. communication. It was all going well. Now they 
Now, if they if you kept George Grider and Roger Payne aboard the in the wardroom, you know maybe you fill in one hole and de start developing that relationship. But all the other elements still work. So that's what you're hoping happens. Right. Is that what happened? That Seth? is not. That is not. So they leave the United States. They leave San Francisco, and they go to Pearl Harbor. And when they're in Pearl Harbor, at this point, George Greider, who's been with Wahoo since her commissioning, been with Mush on all of his patrols, Greider's pulled out, and he's given command of his own submarine. Roger Payne, he was going to make Roger Payne his co-approach officer. He was going to do the same because Payne had been aboard. He knew the procedure. He was part of the original team. Payne gets sick, and I can't remember if it's it, – it, I can't – honestly, I don't remember if it's him or if it's his wife, but somebody gets sick, mm -hmm. and Payne is pulled off the boat. and. So now Mush's team is it's minus, all gone. It's gone. All all of the people yeah, that he had starting O'Kane, from scratch. Yeah. O'Kane, Grider, mm -hmm. Payne, the three people that he relied on most are gone. And he fills mm -hmm. those roles, or he doesn't fill, but they those roles are filled, and they're not necessarily filled by people that he initially or at all trusted. Um the mm -hmm. the, the procedure that he had worked up with O'Kane and Grider and Payne, he tried to implement it again and it just did not work as well. Wahoo's mm. six patrol nets much more. The chemistry is gone. Yeah. It is. And I can imagine them going to Lockwood before they leave on the six patrol and saying, you're sending me to sea with crappy torpedoes and a, and a, and you've re reset, rebooted, we will use that word today, mm -hmm. but you've cleared out my wardroom. I got no weapons and no people. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. What do you expect me to do? I'm, you know, not a one man band here. You can, you can imagine that conversation taking place and Lockwood really worrying. Lockwood would really worry. This guy's falling apart in yeah. front of me. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this is not the same human being that came that I, I saw, you know, early in his tenure. No. And I mean, and you got to understand to the listener, you know, this, this isn't an overnight process. I mean, everybody gets tired. And the mm -hmm. thought is, is it, and, and, and let me clarify real quick here, because we're going to hardly talk about the six patrols, six patrol nets a goose egg for much more they don't sink anything. And, and the Zero. reason, yeah. And the reason for that, he sinks a couple of sand pans, he surfaces and shoots them with his deck gun because he's pissed off, um, but the torpedoes don't work. None of them do not a one he is so furious at this that you know the stress of being a skipper being mm -hmm. a submarine skipper not just a skipper but a submarine skipper and taking you know these frankly a lot of times unnecessary risks they're starting to weigh on him as you said his team has been replaced he's not the same dude that he was in this on december 31st 1942 he is this is now you know late august 1943 Almost a year since you know he's taken command, it's wearing on him. It's wearing on him. I, I, I think I've, I've thought about this a lot, Seth, and I really believe number one, he suffered from PTSD. And oh, of course, sure. Those days it would have gone unrecognized. But number two, he acted as if he believed he was on this trajectory. He was going for this ride. He was just going along for the ride that the fates were going to determine how this evolved, how this worked out over time, that he was an instrument in this larger opera that, um, he, and that he was going to ride this as long as he was required to. And I, I do believe that he was stoic, resigned. I don't know what the right word is with a bad weapons, the, a crew he didn't, a wardroom he didn't trust anymore. Um, but he was going to put his head down and just drive forward, mm -hmm. even if he was driving his head into a brick wall. So he rants and raves, you know, and, and at this mm -hmm. point, this is where Lockwood starts to think, eh, you know what? I think I need to get this dude some rest. And not to say that Morton was going crazy. No, no, no. No, he was just tired. He was just tired and lockwood realizes this and he realizes at this point he probably should order morton off if for no other reason to give him a break 
which he had mm. not had a break. I mean, they come in the port and they're in there for like two weeks and he's out. Bam. I mean, as soon as that submarine's mm. ready to go, he's gone. There is no way. It's pretty time. standard. They would stay at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. The big pink hotel in Waikiki Beach is where the crews were, were sent while the boat was being refitted by the refit crew. Mm. And then the boat crew would come when the boat was ready. Crew would come out of the Royal Hawaiian, you know, and go back on the ship and get underway for the next war patrol. Yeah. And, and he just, he was, he was pooped, man. He was, he was worn out. And Lockwood, frankly, at that point, in my opinion, should have pulled him. You know, if he had any doubts, yeah. and of course, Lockwood says it's post war, but if he had any doubts at all as to whether or not Morton was not, not capable, but just worn out, he should have pulled him. Mm -hmm. Because as we all know, Wahoo's seventh patrol is her final patrol. Mm -hmm. Wahoo leaves Pearl Harbor on September 5th, 1943. Oh, and this is important too. This is very, very important. On her sixth patrol, Wahoo is assigned to the Sea of Japan. No United States submarine had penetrated the Sea of Japan to make any attacks. It was the first time. At all. Yep. It was the first time. He goes out there. He nets a goose egg. He is so incensed at this. He begs Lockwood to send him Yeah, the back. targets are there. The weapons aren't working. Right. It's a target-rich environment. Right. So they said, okay, we're going to give you another chance at it. Yep. You're going to go back. Sends him back to the same hunting grounds again. Probably a mistake there, too. Mm -hmm. He's chomping at the bit to get back to the area that he had failed only a few weeks before. He also, Morton was also not stupid. He realized that his time as a skipper was coming to an end. He knew that this was more than likely his last patrol. Unfortunately, it was his last patrol ever. But he figured that this is probably the last time I'm going to ride Wahoo out to sea, out to, out to war. So we're going to make it the I best I want it to be can. memorable. Exactly. Go out in style. Over the next 30 days, Wahoo sinks four Japanese ships, including the passenger liner Kanran Maru. Uh, when the Kanran Maru sinks, she takes four, 544 people with her. This is a passenger liner. Now, that's not to say that it's all Japanese civilians. It was a liner that was filled with people, Japanese military and civilians. Um, the sinking was reported on Japanese national news. Uh, mm -hmm. Intercepts of this news report by Pearl Harbor let Lockwood know that Wahoo had been busy, and he knew there was only one submarine in the Sea of Japan. He knew exactly who it was. He knew exactly what was going on. He's like, eh, my boy's getting it done. At 0830 hours on October 11th, 1943, the six-inch shore batteries of Soya Misaki Promontory sighted a surfaced American submarine making a dash through the 20 mile wide Cape Soya Strait near the La Perouse Straits and yeah, immediately this is opened between fire. Japan, yeah, between Japan and Sakhalin Island, which was, uh, I can't remember if the Russians owned it or Japan owned it at this point, but it's far north. Yeah. Yeah. That surfaced submarine is obviously USS Wahoo. The airfield at Wakani was notified, and a total of four Japanese airplanes arrived on the scene. We talked about in our previous episode about aircraft attacking a submarine. It was their biggest fear. Well, here comes your biggest fear. Submarine immediately submerges. Um, she was initially betrayed by a trail of oil visible from the air. Now, let me pause here in the story. Two things. One, the words I am reading verbatim are not my own, so I want to be abundantly clear. My friend Paul Crozier, who is a historian, who is a historian on the USS Wahoo, these are his words. I want to give credit where credit is due right now. Two, it is thought that at some point in the day or days previous to this, Wahoo hit a mine. That's the theory, anyway. Is that she hit not not you know boom full connection, but something happened. A, an explosion triggered something, busted something loose, and Wahoo's trailing oil. One of the reasons they think that Morton was on the surface is they were attempting to make repairs in the middle of daylight in Japan. He's trying to get things fixed so he can get the hell out of there and get his people back home. So it's, there's a, there's, you know, you, you will never know, but that's well, what we assume. And they would need to get through this straight to get home anyway. So he's trying to do both, right? Trying right. to, Say hey, we got to this. We may not be able to fix this. Let's get on the other side of La Perouse Strait so we can submer submerge and get home, or while, fix it while we're doing this. Let me tell you that there is no way he should have been on the surface within sight of this shore station. No. So something bad had happened. Exactly. It caused I him to be running on the surface at this point. 
exactly as, as as cavalier and as devil may care as mush morton was he would he wasn't be, stupid he wasn't an idiot he would not have done this unless he absolutely had to there was mm-hmm. to your point bill there was a reason that he was on the surface you know why we'll never know but clearly he wasn't doing it just as a finger in the eye to the japanese he was they were doing something they were doing that for a reason mm-hmm. regardless of this the submarine that was initially sighted submerges she tries to go down this is wahoo of course the pilots then reported seeing a black conning tower and a hull again remember what we were talking about just because they're under the water doesn't mean that you can't see them they could see her um, this they used as a point of aim dropping bombs over the next five hours with the entire coast now alerted to the enemy submarine's presence, two submarine chasers, number 15 and number 23, joined the battle. They made contact with the submarine and began to drop depth charges. At 12.07 hours, following a depth charge run by submarine chaser number 15, a bright metallic object, assumed to be a severed propeller blade, was glimpsed on the ins- in the ensuing explosions. This is bad news, man. It takes a lot to break a propeller blade off of the screw. Yeah. So they're dead at this point. Yeah, this is bad news. Oil continued to rise to the surface. Auxiliary number 18 joined the submarine chasers and aircraft. And there are photographs of this, by the way, which I'll show. Uh, Several more bombs and depth charges were dropped. However, no further contact with the submarine was reported. At approximately 1,400 hours, a very large volume of oil, and this is important too, reached the surface. Over the course of the afternoon, the ensuing slick stretched 50 meters wide and 2,000 meters long. A sample taken revealed it to be diesel fuel. The aircraft were recalled, the ships returned home, and an American submarine was reported sunk. That submarine is undoubtedly USS Wahoo. Now, to my point about the large belch of oil, there's another theory, and of course we'll never know this. There was another theory that Wahoo, when that propeller blade, or theoretically propeller blade, popped up that she went boom, she went kaplunk she went down morton in his attempt to do anything he could to get that boat to the surface it is thought that he pumped everything that wahoo had out to try and make her buoyant to try and rise her mm-hmm. that is the thought do we know no all we know yeah. is that wahoo never does reach the surface again mush morton and all souls aboard never come home mm-hmm she was discovered in 2006 so we have photographs that show the large hull penetration on the upper surface of the of the boat which makes it look like it was sunk by a bomb dropped from an airplane rather than a um an explosion of a depth charge alongside right but you know the the hull is not in very good shape it's uh, heavily encrusted and hard to do any forensic analysis with Either way, I, I think to your point, Bill. I mean, when they're when you're dropping over forty bombs on an aircraft on a submarine, one of them's probably going to hit. You know, and and, oh, and and I know what you're talking about that picture, and I don't know if we can show that because as I, I'm pretty sure we can't because we don't own those photographs. The other ones are public domain, mm-hmm. but look it up, and there is bam right through the deck a bomb. I mean, it was a perfect shot you know and whether that killed morton on with that detonation or not you know we'll never know all Mm -hmm. we know is that she doesn't come home uh wahoo i mean uh, admiral lockwood you know gives an inordinate amount of time for wahoo to come home they send out searches thinking that maybe she's damaged and she's limping home when two weeks pass it's abundantly clear she's not coming home the loss of wahoo absolutely oh yeah 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 he, um, you know, the, the, I don't doubt that he cried every time we lost a submarine, but this one was in particular very, you know, devastating because of, you know, he'd grown very close to yeah. Mush. Yeah. And so and held him up as the ideal to every submarine CO out there. And now the ideal submarine CO doesn't come home. What does that say to all the other submarine COs? Right. Oh, we're, we're expected to die doing this. Yeah. Um, you got to be careful about those messages. And yeah. so um, Dick O'Kane got it. And, you know, there's a great do- loss for Dick O'Kane. And I, you know, I look for evidence that after his friend Mush, his former boss, Skipper, died, that he let up and eased off thinking, well, geez, I don't want to suffer the same fate, but he did not. 
quite the opposite. So, yeah, quite the opposite. Quite the yeah. opposite. Okay, once he reaches, once word reaches him that that Wahoo's gone and that his best friend is gone with it, he basically makes an oath to himself that says, "I am. They are gonna pay. I, I'm gonna kill mm-hmm. every one of those SOBs that I can get my hands on." Which, to his point, he does, and we'll talk mm-hmm. about Tang in another episode. For the final patrol, Morton is awarded his fourth Navy Cross, albeit posthumous. Wahoo's mm-hmm. final tally is 20 ships sunk for over 65,000 tons of Japanese shipping. I don't remember off the top of my head where she ranks. I want to say it's certainly in the top 10 of American submarines. I think number three. Is it? And number three and number six. It's number of ships and tons. I think it's number three and number six. Um, I, but I could be. I could be wrong. I'm, I think you're right on the. No, I think you're right on the number of ships. I think she is number three in the number of ships, because Tang winds up shooting thirty six, I think, which is a Mm. godly amount. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, Wahoo's place in naval lore and legend is cemented forevermore, not just because of her wartime tally, but because of her skipper Dudley Walker Morton. Mm -hmm. He is a legend in the submarine community. Of which I'm not even a member, but I, you know, he's a legend in the submarine community. I he know is. you consider him the same. Same thing with uh-huh. Wahoo. Bill, isn't there another? There was a Wahoo later, another Wahoo, but isn't there a third coming? Yeah. So my, my friend, um, the former Secretary of the Navy, Ken Braithwaite, has declared that a new Virginia class submarine would be named USS. Wahoo 780, I think it is. Uh, eight, no, 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 it's not. Starting with 800s. That's way wrong. And so he's deviating from the practice of naming Virginia class submarines after states. Mm-hmm. And he's uh, declared that a new USS Wahoo will be commissioned. I don't know what the commissioning date is yet, but it's going to be great to see another Wahoo in the water. Very fitting to the legacy of the crew and her legendary skipper. Mm. we've we've gone on a long time about wahoo but she's an important mm. topic and almost and, two hours i can't believe we talked that long on about one ship yeah i didn't think we would frankly but no but she's she's important and she sets the precedent for all who follow and not just all who follow but all who served at the same time because there were guys that were contemporaries of morton's like slade cutter who who were and i'm and okay and you could consider him a contemporary even though he takes takes command after a while but regardless of Mm -hmm. this you know they followed in the footsteps of mush morton and he was Mm -hmm. a trailblazer for the u.s pacific fleet submarine force bill do you have anything else you want to add to this legendary story no um there's no way that you can describe the impact of mush and the guys like him who followed on the legacy of the American submarine force, it still influences, I say us, even though I'm 20 years of driving submarines, it still influences us today. Mm -hmm. And I can only hope that we still have men and women, because there are women on submarines now, who can do in some future war what Mush did in 1943. Mm-hmm. absolute legend absolute hero controversy aside the man was a trailblazer and a legend and he'll be remembered like that forevermore at least by you and i i know and i'm pretty sure mm-hmm. our viewers as well so on that somber note we want to thank you for listening in on our conversation please subscribe to the unauthorized history of the pacific war podcast wherever you receive your podcast give us a rating and review we do appreciate it Also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast. And please do subscribe as it does help people find our show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. And once again, my name is Seth Perrin, and I want to say thank you, Bill. And I'm Bill Toady. We'll see you next time. Adios.